So good evening, everyone. I just want to welcome you to this webinar. Um, I'm just standing in for um, Mandy Neville, who sends her apologies, and um, bear with us um, for this uh, Blue Tongue um, update. We are recording this webinar, and it will be circulated to everyone who registered within the next 24 hours. It's the um, second technical webinar um, that we've uh, produced, uh, the first one just before Christmas, and we are um, going to continue these on alternate Wednesdays and please if you're interested uh, do register for each one um, via the HDB. Um, we're going to hear from each of our speakers today and then there'll be an opportunity for uh, the audience to ask questions. We do have a huge number of attendees who've registered so please bear with us. We may not be able to answer every question but put your questions in the chat throughout um, and uh, so we we have got a record of your questions and complete a feedback form at the end, particularly if there are additional questions or topics you're interested in. So we'll try not to leave anyone hanging, but equally um, we are we're not planning to go on all night. So um, uh, so let me just introduce you to today's speakers. Um, we've got Sasha Van Helvoort for the contingency veterinary head from the APHA. And she will also speak alongside um, Gordon Hickman, who is the head of exotic disease policy for DEFRA. They'll be followed by um, Christopher Sanders, who is a research fellow in veterinary entomology at the Purbright Institute. Um, and he will be talking about uh, coolicoides um, and biting midges and the blue tongue virus, followed by Peter Mertens, who um, as far as I know, has spent his entire career looking at blue tongue. He's um, currently Professor of Virology at the School of Medicine and Science at the University of Nottingham. Uh, Peter's going to be talking us, to us about epidemiology and how the, um, the virus might overwinter. And he'll be uh, drawing on experiences from uh, the previous BT8 outbreak. And then um, finally in today's webinar, Rudolf um, from the APHA, the APHA Veterinary Lead Small Ruminants Expert Group. Uh, Rudolf will be talking on and uh, giving us an update on Schwannenberg um, virus. And then we will follow the talks with questions and answers. But please do, as I've already said, put your questions in the chat um, throughout the webinar. Just wanted to point out this resource hub that the Ruminant Health and Welfare Group have made available. It's absolutely brilliant. Frequently, frequently answered cross questions, um, please do go there. Um, there's also a hotline for um, vets or farmers to phone up and ask, ask questions. Um, HDB have set up that hotline um, and, and there will be a feedback form. So please do let us know if you've got any tips or questions that um, haven't been answered. On that, um, on that, on that uh, Ruminant Health and Welfare Blue Tongue page, there is an information leaflet that is available for you to download and share. Share with your clients, share with your colleagues. Please do make use of that information. Um, there's a huge amount of work that's gone into this and it's some really good stuff there. We've been working with some great experts, um, so um, make use of that, please. And just to say, particularly if you're in the Norfolk area, um, just before Christmas, we had an in-person farmer meeting run down in Kent, and there is a further meeting in Norfolk this um, coming Monday, Monday the 15th of January. There's a huge collaboration of associations who are involved um, in, this, in this meeting. Um, it's free, it's for farmers to come along and ask questions and um, and find find out more and help them in in what in in Norfolk and Kent there's a particularly awkward situation for farmers they've got ewes coming up for lambing and needing to know about licenses and what the situation is um, so if you have people in the Norfolk area please do tell them about that in-person meeting um, and thank you to everyone who's involved with that and and on that note we are well aware that there are some farmers and potentially vets who um, may want extra support and there are a number of organizations that it would be worth you sending people to or um, accessing yourselves so um, you, you've got you can access these and the same um, contacts are on the the frequently 
uh, via the resource hub. So go to the Ruminant Health and Welfare website to access these resources. So um, that's um, me. I'm not going to any more um, any more talking. I will stop sharing my screen and we will go straight over to Sasha um, for the first presentation. Just wait for the presentation. Yeah, fabulous. Um, hi there, my name's Sasha van Helvoort and I'm Contingency Veterinary Head within APHA. Um, and um, with me today is Gordon Hickman as well, um, who is helping me if you have any policy questions after, um, after this presentation. Um, so at the end when we do all our questions. Um, now, I'm unable to use my slides because we have a few technological issues at the minute and hence also um, why Gordon um, is also joining by phone. So it's all a bit more difficult than usual. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So I'll be giving you guys the an update about Blue Tongue and where we are. I mean, you've hopefully a lot of you were on the previous um, webinar, so um, trying not to cover too much of what we did then. Um, so for update, as you are, aware, are probably all aware, the first um, case was confirmed um, on the 10th of November. And currently we are actually now at 47 confirmed infected animals, of which there's 45 cattle and we still have only had two sheep that have come back as positive. And they're all residing on 18 different premises um, in Kent and also in the Norfolk temporary control zone. We still at present do not have ha any evidence that blue tongue virus has been circulating in Great Britain and um, we continue our surveillance in, in these zones and I'll pick up on that after a bit later. Um, and we are still culling um, all positive animals at present um, to minimise the risk of onward transmission and it's all related to the midges. Next slide please. So um, the temporary control zone, um, so as you're aware, the first one was the one around Kent, that's BTD 202301, that was our first case. And, um, and then um, we've been doing a lot of surveillance there, then a bit, and that case was actually found by our surveillance um, that we were undertaking, um, which we always take an annual um, every year in all the high risk areas. So we um, check various farms and there we found our first case and the same for the first case in Norfolk. So the temporary control zone was put across, um, over on, on the um, Kent side. Then we had further cases, so we realised we had to increase the size of the um, Kent one, so that became the extended and temporary control zone, which then obviously moved, um, and then we found the control, the case in Norfolk, and then we had a control zone there. So if you can go to the next slide, please. And so here is the um, next slide. So here it shows the map at the minute of what it looks like. So we've got our 10 kilometre zone up in Norfolk and we've got our extended temporary control zone around the original um, 10 kilometre in the Canterbury area. And um, so obviously within these temporary control zones, no moves are allowed um, and we are continuing our surveillance. So. In our surveillance, there is about 500 premises in the Kent zone, and that is including into the extended zone, and about 350 premises in the um, in the Norfolk zone. Um, we have undertaken most of the surveillance in Kent, but there's still a lot of surveillance that needs to be undertaken and um, started in the Norfolk one. We've already taken about 16,000 samples. Um, in the various premises we are visiting, so that's a lot of sampling and the lab is also very busy with undertaking um, all the PCR tests on those. And um, we're also, sadly, we're still finding new premises um, and new animals. Um, and this is because registration of the land is not being um, 
done properly or correctly. And so we would really encourage everyone to let um, um, tell the livestock keepers to correctly register. And there is guidance on that and there's guidance on gov.uk. Um, so please um, just try and get people to register because it really helps us finding people and um, testing the animals. Um, because we really want to know um, if there's any um, more disease out there and it will help us with stopping the spread um, should any um, should there still be animals there and help us control it for the following uh, season. Um, next slide please. So movement controls, um, so for the licensing update, um, I don't think there's much difference to uh, before Christmas where um, movements uh, out of the TZ, out of the temporary control zones is um, obviously not allowed um, and um, unless it's licensed and um, only to and you can so Movements are allowed to a slaughterhouse out of the zone, but it has to be a designated abattoir. And obviously you're allowed to move into the zone. Um, movements of live animals out of the zone isn't, isn't possible, um, but it is when there's a um, serious welfare issue. Um, there is a derogation, as we already um, probably you were already aware of, and that's for the movement of dairy cattle for milking. So that is allowed and any other movement is um, via a license. Um, I think it's also really important that there's time needed for these licenses. So um, we really ask if people could do that five days in advance. And just to also be aware, it might be the case that you aren't able to um, to actually receive the license if the risk is considered too high. Um, so just because you ask for one doesn't necessarily mean you will receive it. But I can tell you and assure that um, the majority are issued um, as long as the risks aren't too high. Next slide, please. Um, so types of moves that were not allowed are obviously um, to undesignated abattoirs, so outside of the TCZ, so um, abattoirs do need to be designated for them to move out of the DS TCZ. And then, like I said, um, only movements out of the TCZ are if there's um, a welfare reason. And to note on this um, license that um, we um, will allow in exceptional circumstances, it will mean that either pre-movement testing um, or post move and or post-movement testing will be required. And this is um, testing that would be undertaken by um, your private vet or by yourselves if your vets that are on this call. Um, and um, the testing in the lab will be under, will be um, taken, um, DEFRA will be paying for that. So uh, I suppose that is helpful. Um, but uh, time is also required to do that testing. As you're aware, the lab is very, very busy. So be aware of that as well. So also make sure that these moves often people know in advance um, if they need to move their animals um, to go and lamb at home um, or for whatever reason. So they are aware of this in advance. So please make sure that the necessary, um, that you do apply for the licenses, even if it's more than five days. I think it's it's really helpful if you know it's, it's in two, three weeks time, please do already um, contact the licensing team so they can already look at things and set things up um, with the lab as well for um, taking bloods. Um, so, and I think, yeah, so at this point, I, that's all I have to mention. Um, I'd like to um, remind everyone that blue tongue is a notifiable disease and um, please do call us um, when, um, when you do have a suspect case. Uh, last time we um, spoke about it and I'm sure there'll be pictures from the other speakers um, with symptoms um, for this blue tongue, but uh, so that you know what to look for if you and then you can give us a call and we'll be out and having a look. I want to ask um, Gordon to just to introduce himself. He's here on the phone. Hopefully that'll work. And um, 
otherwise you'll be hearing from him and myself at the end um, for any questions you might have. Well, we'll give it a go. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Sasha, if you can give a, a big yes. thumbs up. Yeah. I can well, hear. good evening, everyone, and, and apologies. We've got a bit of IT issues. Um, I can't dial in at all um, as, a, as a presenter, so apologies for that. So I, I'm Gordon Hickman. I'm head of the Exotic Disease Control Team. Um, so we've got the policy ownership in England. I mean, Sasha's set out the position really clearly and well, I hope, um, and we'll pick up any sort of policy type questions at the end. I, I guess just wanted to stress that what we're looking at, at the moment is to contain the disease in you know, the, the east and the, and the southeast and better understand how much undisclosed disease is there. Um, you know, as Sasha said, I think um, none of these cases have had overt clinical signs. Um, and we'll probably discuss that later as to why that might be. Um, so it makes it much harder for us in terms of understanding the, the amount of disease in the area. And what we don't want to do is for infected animals to move throughout um, GB and, and then set ourselves a real issue next um, spring, summer, when the weather warms up, when we've got midge activity, um, and when we've got the ability for, for the virus to replicate it in the midge. And what we don't want is that, that explosion. So we're looking to manage the situation at the moment um, in this strange period um, between um, midge activity still ongoing um, and what we're, I think, calling the vector low period, which hasn't started yet. And, and I'm sure Chris will tell us about that. So happy to pick up questions at the end. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, um, both um, Sasha and Gordon. Um, really helpful. And I'm sure people do be putting your questions into the chat ready. Um, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, um, who is Christopher Sanders, a research fellow at, um, in veterinary entomology at the Purbright Institute. I, I'm really hoping we're going to be able to hear Chris. Um, are you there, Chris? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you fine. That's excellent. Um, excellent. Okay. <laughs> by, by Apologies. <laughs> Apologies for the disembodied voice. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm Chris Sanders. I've um, been working with um, Kulikordis uh, and their ability to transmit the tongue virus um, for about 15 years, not quite as long as, as, as Peter's been working on this, but still some time. Um, can you forward slide, please? Anna? There we go. So just a, a quick recap. So blue tongue virus is a non-contagious vector-borne virus, and it's the cause of blue tongue disease of ruminants. We normally only see clinical disease in sheep, um, but it also infects cattle, deer, goats, camelids, and other ruminants. BTV is exotic to the UK, and we'd like to keep it that way. Um, and the thing about BTV is essentially there's 29, maybe more, effectively different diseases so different serotypes and many strains per serotype and each of these can have different characteristics we've seen dramatic changes in btv uh, epidemiology since 1998 we've seen the emergence of exotic viruses in uh, northern temperate regions like northern europe we've seen an increase in the global disease incidence and we've seen an increase in virus diversity in endemic regions next slide please so just a brief history of kind of where, where we got to, how we've got to where we are now. Um, if I was speaking here prior to 1998, I've described blue tongue virus as a tropical or subtropical disease of sheep and cattle. Um, it was first described in the 18th century, thought to be confined to Africa, and then was um, reported um, around the tropics and subtropics. By the sort of, uh, 60s, uh, you know, the 50s and 60s, it was encouraging into southern Europe, so uh, Iberian Peninsula uh, and Greek islands. But in 1998, we saw a real step change with multiple serotype incursions into southern Europe with a possible link to climate change. And then in 2006, the uh, first ever big outbreak of Bhutan virus in northern Europe with BTB8, where we saw significant mortality and significant economic damage. That virus reached the UK in 2007 and was fortunately controlled by a vaccination program which worked really well in the UK. And so we didn't see disease in uh, 2008, whereas the continent did. 
Um, vaccination on the continent did work and the virus disappeared as we hoped. But in 2015, BTV8 re-emerged in France and it's possibly due to um, artificial insemination. So it's been kept on ice for a long time and the infected semen was then used. And then we get to last year where we saw our second big outbreak in Northern Europe of BTV3 and um, that's a pretty scary virus with significant mortality seen in the Netherlands. Next slide, please. So blue tongue virus is transmitted almost entirely by Culicordes biting midges. This is one on the right. And the first fact about um, Culicordes is their size. They are pretty much the smallest blood feeding insects, much smaller than horseflies, aedes, mosquitoes, and Culicordes, as you can see. They have a near worldwide distribution, absent only from Antarctica, Hawaii, and New Zealand. Um, there's about 1,500 species worldwide, and we have 50 species in the UK. If you've been to um, the uplands of Scotland, you might be familiar with the Scottish biting midge. Um, and um, we're not actually considering that a, a, a vector, but it's a similar, similar size to the, to the insects that we're talking about here. Gilicordes can be identified in large part by their wing patterns. You can see the bottom right, they have these kind of um, collection of spots uh, and uh, markings that we can use to identify them. And they are hugely abundant. Again, if you've been to Scotland, you know this, but we can collect tens or hundreds of thousands of these insects in a single trap in a single night and not really dent their population even over an extended period. They're hugely abundant. And with that comes really high biting rates much higher biting rates than you'd see with other vector species where we can get you know, tens or even hundreds of insects feeding per minute in a, in a, in a significant swarm. I think about Culicordes, oh, sorry, get back one. Thank you. Uh, Culicordes breed in damp organic matter, that soil, leaf litter and animal dung, they do not breed in free water like mosquitoes do, but any of that sort of damp rich organic matter um, they can survive in. And a few species are vectors of arboviruses, including so arboviruses that are often called born viruses, a few species of vectors of, of blue tongue virus. And this includes six species of, um, uh, of culicordes that are native to the UK. Female culicordes require a blood meal to produce eggs, and this biting habit leads to their role as vectors. Next slide, please. So, this is the life cycle of. Um, Culicordes, the females lay their eggs in um, the damp organic matter, so animal dung maybe, or leaf mold, and then larvae hatch and develop three or four larval instars. And this is where the, the um, majority of the insects are, um, spend the winter as larvae, and then they pupate in the spring and emerge as adults where they meet and then undergo cycles of blood feeding and egg laying, what well, the females do anyway. The males do not blood feed. Um, so they'll produce several generations um, or a single generation per year, depending on the species. So the vector species we're talking about actually have multiple generations uh, per year. Next slide, please. So farms, unfortunately, provide everything that these species of midge need. Um, so we have hosts in high density because we're farming them. So sheep, cattle, deer, horses, all really good hosts for most of these vectors. And these animals generate the breeding habitats that these insects need. And because we've got the breeding habitat and the hosts, the only other thing that these insects need is a mate and they're found in abundance. So we can find them in the soil, in the manure, um, and in, in tank dung pads. Next slide, please. So we know they're, they're present on the farm, but how do they actually transmit the blue tongue virus? So an uninfected adult midge will bite a viremic or um, tick ruminant host pick up that virus in its blood meal. It will then incubate that virus and replicate it inside its body. Um, and this process takes a period called the extrinsic incubation period, which we'll explain in a minute. And it's dependent on temperature. Once infected, the adult vector then is ready to bite um, and potentially infect a susceptible ruminant host. So it passes it on to the next animal. That host then develops a viremia and is infected to vectors after about two to four days. That, um, that animal will be then infected two bites for at least 14 days and perhaps longer. And that's really difficult to nail down how long uh, an animal will be infected to host. We can detect virus genome for a long time. We can isolate um, a live virus for a much shorter time, 
but um, that's really difficult to nail down the precise time for how long these, these animals will be infected to infect. Next slide, please. So killer colonies are what we call biological vectors, and to be transmitted by image, the, the virus must replicate and disseminate from the gut to the salivary gland. So they're not just a dirty needle going from animal to animal. This is a biological um, cycle that must happen within the midge. So the virus comes in with the blood meal and it then has to go through the gut, um, enter the, what's called the hemocell, the blood of the insect, and then replicate in secondary um, organs and then reach the salivary gland and replicate there. Now this isn't a very good thing for, for uh, an insect to have if you're taking on pathogens that get through your gut wall. You don't want that to happen. You'll be, um, you'll be sick from other, other pathogens. So this is, there's lots of barriers to virus dissemination from the gut. And it's only actually possible in a very small proportion or a small proportion of individuals, even of vector culicoli species. And this is what we call vector competence, the proportion of, of individuals that's actually able to transmit the virus, get the virus from the gut to the salivary gland. In culicoli, this is usually quite a small percentage. It can be as low as 0.1%, but so five to 10% to is more typical. And so this process is actually really inefficient, but there's lots and lots of insects. So at least some will be infected. So the EIP, the extrinsic incubation period, is the time it takes for the virus to get from the gut to the salivary glands of, of a susceptible midge. And this period is actually dependent on the virus strain, the vector species and population, and also the ambient temperature. And you can see on top right, you can see in this individual, and um, you can see its eyes there, we've dissected this individual, and we can see virus in green in the salivary glands. So we know this is a disseminated um, infection in this particular insect. And if insect, if we hadn't dissected it, would have been capable of transmitting blue tongue virus. Next slide, please. So the duration of the EIP is directly related to temperature. And this is a function of virus replication, which I'm sure Peter can um, explain at length. But BCB replication can only occur when the temperature is over 12 degrees. Under 12 degrees, we don't see any virus replication in these midges. So because the midges are in the, uh, in the environment and they're um, cold-blooded, poikilothermic insects, um, all their activity is dependent on the ambient temperature. And it's not just the virus replication that's dependent on temperature. Everything the midge does is dependent on temperature as well. So their development, their activity, their fighting rate and survival is dependent on temperature. Kilocodes midges are active at temperatures above four degrees um, Celsius in the UK. Um, and it's good hard frost like we're having at the moment that kills most adults. But optimum temperature of both for um, virus replication, so it happens much faster when we get to sort of 23, 24, 25 degrees, uh, and the insects are much uh, more active, but then that drops off as the temperature gets a little bit too much for our UK species of midge. Once culicolis have picked up a virus, uh, a virus and actually disseminated and got to the saliva glands, those are infected for life. And although it's really inefficient uh, in terms of acquisition of virus and developing a, a transmissible infection, the um, transfer of, inf of virus from infected culicolis to susceptible ruminants is really efficient. And we can actually, we've actually seen that a single infected midge can transmit a full infection to um, uh, to our ruminants, and we get, you know, there's no difference between a single or several midges um, infected feeding on that on that animal. We still get the same result in terms of, of infection and disease. We don't see any evidence, or very limited evidence, for transavarial transmission of of blue tongue virus in culicoides. So the females are not passing the virus uh, onto their offspring through the eggs. This means that the adult midges are emerging um, naive to blue tongue virus and they must acquire it in that first blood meal. Next slide, please. So the, this also means that blue tongue virus transmission is seasonal. And Culicordes adults are typically active between April and November. And that's when they start decreasing in numbers. But the peaks in activity are firstly in May and then secondly in September. Culicordes are active at dusk and dawn, they are crepuscular. And the activity is strongly influenced by the weather. If, um, if it's a bit windy or, or wet, these insects will hunker down and wait for the conditions to be nice. 
we monitor the activity of Kilicodes through a network of midge traps that's run by Dr. Marion England, who runs the Kilicodes Reference Laboratory uh, in the UK. And she has a, a network of um, UV midge traps, works exactly like a, a moth to, a, to a, um, a light. These insects are attracted to ultraviolet light. And she can monitor the activity of, of, of these vector um, Kilicodes at these midge traps located across England at farms and zoos. And at this time of year, we are now almost entering the seasonal vector load period. This is a period of low BTB transmission because we've got um, limited or no um, adult vector activity and the temperatures are too low for virus transmission. Typically, this is from December to early April. We have had a late start to the seasonal vector load period this year because December was really warm. And it's only now that we're seeing temperatures that would actually stop um, Kilicordia's activity. Females that have bit of an animal earlier in the year may still be infected. Now, we can actually tell that they have um, had a blood meal and have fed on an animal by looking at their abdomen. So we can tell the newly emerged insects from the older insects. Older insects may have acquired um, a, vi a virus from an infected animal earlier in the year when the temperatures were warm enough for virus replication to occur. And they're still kind of hanging on um, at the limits of their survival. But we can declare that seasonal vector free periods, vector low periods, sorry, when all the traps in the network are consistently collecting less than five of these blood fed females. So it shows that the activity of old and new uh, insects is really low, and therefore the risk of transmission by midges and to midges is also really low in this period. Next slide, please. So another key aspect of Chilicordia's biology is their dispersal behavior. So BTV is transmitted, but also spread by the activity of biting midges. As I said earlier, most things that a midge needs occur really close by. So most midge flights, most Chilicordia flights, are really short, less than one kilometer, maybe up to five kilometers, moving within and between neighboring farms, between animals in different fields. And this is reflected by what we see in um, to be spread, which is less, usually less than five kilometers per day on land. But there are occasions when we see long distance dispersal of uh, culicoides that have been implicated in the introduction of bluetongue virus to Ireland, particularly um, the Mediterranean, but also the UK. And this long distance dispersal on prevailing winds can carry infected midges from the continent to the UK and therefore initiate an outbreak when those midges then feed. This is going to be a really rare event, but we need to understand several things about the um, Cudicolis flight and also the, the, um, the weather conditions under which it can occur. And using these, we've actually developed a model a modeling environment uh, with the UK Met Office to determine the risk of incursion from the continent. And this is used actively in, um, by APHA in their um, uh, disease monitoring. And it gives us an idea of the timing and location of incursions and outbreaks of bluetongue virus when we have disease risk in the continent. This is in the absence of movement of infected animals that this becomes really important. Next slide, please. So a little bit of what can we do? Um, we really want to break this transmission cycle and the best way of doing that with bluetongue virus is the vaccination of um, the ruminant host. Unfortunately, there's no vaccine for BTV3 currently available. The vaccines are serotype specific, and although inactivated vaccines were used really successfully in 2007, 8, 9, 2008, 9, 10, sorry, um, to mitigate BTV8, um, the BTV8 vaccine will not protect against BTV. Now, as we're hoping that um, companies are producing, um, uh, the vaccine for BTV3, but there is going to be a delay in production of that vaccine. So what can we do about breaking that transmission cycle whilst we wait? Next slide, please. Unfortunately, there's not a lot we could do in terms of vector control. Because these insects are present pretty much everywhere in a farm, removal of breeding habitats, either through uh, moving dung heaps and things like that, is not a particularly effective way of reducing food quality population. And insecticidal spraying of vector habitats is not recommended just because of the amount of habitats that are, their diffuse nature in the environment, 
uh, and the sheer area that you'd have to cover to make any dent in these populations. So that leads us to kind of do something with the animals rather than the environment. And repellents have been um, suggested, things like DEET, which you might be familiar with from um, for, um, your personal intake repellent for humans. They do repel culicoides and prevent contact with the animal. But their effect is really transient and lasts hours rather than days or weeks and hasn't been shown to affect gluten transmission in the field. So we can't really recommend those. What about the poron insecticides you might be familiar with to combat fly strike and, and things like that, synthetic pyrethroid porons. These kill, will kill culicoides in the lab, but they don't necessarily prevent transmission to the treated animal because the insect may bite before actually it's killed by the, um, the, the trace of pyrethroid that's on the animal. They're a little bit more persistent than um, repellents appear to be. Um, but we're talking about lasting days rather than weeks or months. So it's going to be repeated treatment of, of animals that is going to be required to see any sort of knockdown. Again, there is no evidence to suggest that these actually are really efficacious in the field in um, reducing BTV transmission. That said, there's not an awful lot of work out there um, on, on insecticidal treatments for BTV. The next um, mitigation, sorry, back one, thank you. Stabling has been um, suggested as a, a mitigation. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to um, determine whether this will actually work. It's very, going to be very much context dependent. What sort of stable or shed you're talking about? Culicoides will still enter stables and sheds because their hosts are in there. So if you've got a big open uh, uh, shed that's open on two sides, it's very different from a shed that's, that's sealed against um, uh, insect incursion. Culicoides will definitely enter sheds, especially when it's more inclement outside and you've got uh, a high host density inside. They really don't mind about coming in. The difference you can achieve with vector proof accommodation, if you start screening um, uh, yeah, the, the entrance and exit to, to accommodation with mesh, particularly if mesh that has a small enough aperture that the insects can't get through it, that's less than uh, 0.5 millimeters aperture, potentially in, uh, treated with insecticide as well, residual insecticide, um, then you can kind of mechanically prevent uh, incursion of midges into that accommodation. If you then provide, also provide ventilation, so you have a positive air pressure, which then pushes the insects away uh, from um, that holding, then you can actually effect, generate, or create vector-proof accommodation. And there's anecdotal evidence of um, this having an impact on BTV transmission from, from the Dutch farmers we've spoken to. But it's worth um, recalling that this is only gonna work when there's the, um, the economics work and the um, logistics and um, technical aspects can actually be achieved on farm. It's only really gonna be um, of use when you've got high uh, value animals in a fairly closed space. So something like an, um, uh, an artificial insemination center or um, uh, a specific group of animals that you'd want to keep um, uh, for your BTV in preference to others because the space is going to be a premium. Next slide, please. So just a summary on cuticoides. Culicoides spread BTV. The adult females are required for transmission, but of a large part of, of, of BTV transmission. It's only certain species of culicoides that transmit um, uh, BTV, and it's only some individuals of those species that can transmit BTV. But because they're so hugely abundant, we get such high biting rates that infection is compensated um, by the sheer numbers. Temperature is a really important driver of blue tongue virus transmission. It determines both the activity of the midges and the virus replication within them. And therefore, BTV is a seasonal um, disease, or seasonal virus. So you expect to see disease when those uh, insects are active. We have a seasonal vector loan period from January to March, with peaks of activity in May and September. So we're likely to see um, the, the disease load increase over summer till we get to that peak of an uh, autumn emergence of insects when there's lots of insects available and a substantial amount of virus in, um, in the ruminants. And then you get this explosion of cases 
pretty quickly as what we, we saw in uh, the Netherlands this year. Cuticolis can spread BTV over large distances. Most transmissions can be relatively close scale because they're moving between animals on farms and between farms, but occasionally we get these large jumps um, that are due to windborne culicoides moving large distances, uh, particularly over water. Unfortunately, our control options are limited or unproven against BTV transmission. So vector-free accommodation, if it can be achieved um, and the, the finances work out, may reduce transmission. So I think that's me. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, I can't show my face. Thank you, Anna. Um. Thank you very much, Chris. Can I just quickly ask you one question whilst you're still there? And that's just yep. come in. Do you know how long eggs and larvae survive for? And what at what low temperatures do they die out? So eggs and larvae, are, because they're in the ground, they're actually quite protected. Um, so if we get significant flooding, like we've had um, this week, we can wash those insects out. But the abundance is such that you know, we might have a slow start to the year if it's very cold, but we won't actually damage the, the population, if you like, of, of eggs and larvae um, just by being, by being cold. Obviously, there's good years and bad years, um, mm -hmm. but we haven't got a good um, picture of kind of, uh, if it's a really cold winter, we don't necessarily see a really low vector season the following year. No, okay. That's great. Thank you very much, Chris. And um, please stay around for, for more questions, I'm sure, at the end. Um, I'm going to go straight over to uh, Peter Mertens, who currently at University of Nottingham. Um, thank you, Peter. I'll, I'll let you go ahead. Right. Thank you. Right. So I'll just um, try to get my screen up. Right, so um, I'm going to talk to you about um, blue tongue virus in the UK 2023, the epidemiology and overwintering. And I'd just like to say thank you for Chris. He's uh, covered a, a great deal of the territory, so it makes my job a lot easier. Um, right, I'm going to use um, some of the historical stuff um, about blue tongue really as an illustration of what we think is going to happen and what happened last time, and join the dots, as it were. Um, so blue tongue virus uh, exists right around the world between about 35 degrees south, and it's endemic up to about 48 degrees north, all right, with further incursions beyond that up to about 55 degrees north, which um, takes in sort of the very south of Denmark and, and basically potentially the whole of England, but so far, nothing as far north really as Scotland, which um, is, is probably quite lucky for people living that far north. Um, as Chris has already said, uh, the, the virus um, before 1998 was really restricted to the south of the Mediterranean in, in our part of the world. Um, there were a couple of relatively short-lived and minor incursions involving single serotypes into Spain by BTV4 um, into the Iberian Peninsula, so Spain and Portugal, and BTV10 into Cyprus and Greece. Um, but beyond that, um, really nothing, and they both died out fairly quickly. But then in 1998, everything started to um, kick off with new viruses, new strains, new serotypes arriving pretty much every year uh, into southern and, and central Europe. Um, and then in 2006, a completely unexpected event, BTV8 arrived in the Maastricht region of the Netherlands and then spread essentially to most of uh, the countries in, in western northern Europe causing one of the largest outbreaks ever seen of, of blue tongue virus, um, because really the entire ruminant population in the region was naive. Uh, there were no resistance or antibodies, and the virus could make hay, really, while it was there. Um, then, oh, it's me again. Um, this is, 
Right, I'll, I'll, I'll go back and forward again. This is what happened in the Netherlands um, with the BTV8 outbreak. It, it, it started in the Maastricht region, and this, this follows the weekly identification of new cases and strains uh, um, uh, on new farms in the region. And as you can see, it gradually expanded um, right the way through up to the coast by um, October. Uh, but the important thing about this is this was a relatively low density spread, small numbers of animals um, and, and relatively few deaths. And there was certainly a hope that the um, outbreak, because of the colder winters in, in Northern Europe, it, it was hoped that it would basically die out during the winter. The, most of the animals, most of the ruminants are, are only infectious for two or three weeks. And the midges, most of them would be killed off with by the frosts and they have a relatively short lifespan anyway. So it was anticipated that the vector low or vector free period would bring an end to the outbreak and it would simply disappear. But unfortunately, that isn't what happened. The virus has clearly has um, effective overwintering mechanisms um, that allow it to persist through the cold weather and then re-emerge when the midges come out in the following year. And this is the situation in 2007. And as you can see, there's a large number of cases in the Netherlands, it's spread into France, and Germany, these red dots don't represent individual animals, they represent separate farms. And because of the density of spread, each farm, once an animal had been identified on that farm as being positive, they didn't test any more animals on that farm. It was simply positive and it was spreading through all of the individual animals. So as I say, it spread to other countries in Europe, including the UK, and this was the first ever occurrence of blue tongue virus in the field in in the uk um and it was the start of you know various the problems we've seen chris has mentioned that um Kilicoides can be blown by the wind and and i assume rather that they have a mechanism to stop them landing simply landing on water because it wouldn't be a good thing for them to do so once they're up in the air and they're blown out over the sea they will carry on flying and, and experiments have shown that a midge can actually flap its wings for up to 16 hours. So at five to 10 kilometers per hour, they can travel a really significant distance. And here you can see sand blowing up from um, North Africa into uh, the Mediterranean islands and into Italy. And it's exactly this sort of process that we think it can spread infected midges. Maybe inefficient, but because a single bite from a single infected midge can cause a, a ruminant to become infected, it can start an outbreak and local transmission. This is a, um, the name uh, program that Chris has already mentioned. And the, the program run by the Met Office showed that on the 4th and 5th of August in 2007, the conditions were perfect for a plume of particles to spread up over East Anglia from infected regions of the Netherlands. And the two little black crosses you can see represent the, the two um, cases, the two first cases that were detected in the UK. And that was the start of, of the outbreak that actually occurred in the UK. Um, this again shows that the arrival of those two um, cases in East Anglia, and then the virus did actually spread by local transmission. So it was a genuine outbreak. And here you've got the, the control and surveillance zones shown up at the time, covering a very large chunk of England um, with all the problems that we're seeing now in terms of animal movements um, to slaughterhouses and so on. And, and it caused massive problems for the farmers, but again, at the start of this outbreak, the number of animals infected was actually relatively small. Um, and in discussions with DEFRA, it, it was uh, originally we couldn't get a vaccine uh, and DEFRA made the bold move of paying for a vaccine up front to the vaccine manufacturers. So they did produce a vaccine 
and it was delivered and it was deployed in the UK prior to anywhere else and effectively provided a buffer preventing further spread of the virus when it potentially re-emerged in the following year. So this was the tail end of 2007 going into 2008 and this is from January 2008. So we were entering the, we're in the cold period, much as we are now. And when the midges re-emerged, the virus had been controlled and didn't spread because of vaccination. So we were the only country in Europe to control the virus that year. It continued on to spread down into France, and I don't have the time to show you all the slides, but it went through thousands and thousands of, of farms and was only finally controlled in France in 2010. So they had another two years of massive losses. Um, I want to talk a little bit about replication and the effect of temperature. I know this is a complicated slide, um, and it basically is a cartoon of the virus replicating in, in the cell. And it, it, we have entry, uncoating, synthesis of, of viral RNA and then translation proteins, reassembly of progeny. But the point I want to make is in this blue square, all of the synthesis of the genome of progeny viruses, every single bit of it is carried out by a polymerase en enzyme that actually is actually part of the, the parental and then the progeny virus particles. None of the cell enzymes are involved at all. And the point about this polymerase, it has a very defined optimum temperature, all right? As Chris has already mentioned, down here, below about 10 to 15 degrees, the virus is pretty much inactive. Um, and it doesn't really matter how, how active the midges are, because once they become infected, the virus enters their system, it won't spread, it won't be able to get to the salivary glands probably before the insect dies of old age. Whereas at high temperatures, high ambient temperatures here, 28 to 38 degrees, which we might see in a very hot summer, the virus is about as active as it can be. And, and therefore transmission occurs very quickly, more quickly than at lower temperatures. And there's a, a gradation all the way up from around 20 degrees upwards. So, hot summers are clearly not a good thing in terms of blue tongue transmission and i suggest that it is not merely by chance that when the virus first arrived in the netherlands in 2006 it was one of the hottest years on records with a significant number of people dying from heat stroke and things and i heard on the news this morning that 2023 is the hottest european year on record so far so you know, these high temperatures are clearly an important factor. This is um, a graph. It doesn't come right the way up to date because I couldn't find a good one. Really looking at temperature in Europe. And there were two early outbreaks in um, 1958 and then in the mid 70s of BTV4 and BTV10 into Cyprus and, and Spain. Um, but then with the climate change and increasing warming, which has carried on since, we then got another 20 incursions from, from 1998 onwards, literally every single year, a new strain, a new serotype arrived in, in Europe. So the world had fundamentally changed and, and this has been linked very solidly to climate change and increased trade because not only have you got to have the right environment for the virus to replicate, it's also got to arrive in some way. And, and it is unclear how BTV8 arrived in the Netherlands. It's suggested that it might have come in in an infected insect in flowers imported from Africa. And I believe there's a significant trade in cut flowers from Kenya. And these viruses have all the genetic characteristics of African viruses, uh, but we can't specifically attribute them to, to one region because we don't have a full data set for the genetic variability of the virus in, in relevant parts of Africa. Um, 
So what defines a blue tongue virus outbreak? So although windborne midges from mainland Europe can infect small numbers of individual animals, this is an inefficient process and does not by itself represent an outbreak. Um, this is a few animals that have, have caught the virus. An outbreak, as we saw with BTV8 and, and more recently with BTV3 in the Netherlands, is large scale, potentially involving thousands of farms, not just individual animals. And it requires local BTV infection, amplification and transmission by midges, as we've seen in Europe. Now, a question that's frequently asked, why cull the animals that are infected by midges? Well, what we're specifically trying to do, I suggest, is prevent persistence of the virus and an opportunity for the virus to overwinter. We know that these viruses do overwinter and can re-emerge in the spring, but there has to be a source for the infected vi infectious virus in order to restart an outbreak the following year. So by removing all known sources of virus infected animals locally, what we're doing is, is allowing um, the virus not to persist locally and re-emergence will depend on the virus re-emerging perhaps in the Netherlands, starting up a decent sized outbreak there, infecting enough midges, and then uh, enough of them eventually might blow over to restart the outbreak here in the summer. So what culling is doing is reducing persistence and giving us a delay for the onset of a major outbreak, which is really important. And it will give us time to vaccinate if and when a vaccine becomes available. So what are the overwintering mechanisms? Well, blue tongue uh, infected rooms are usually only viremic and capable of in, uh, infecting midges for two or three weeks. Uh, the, as Chris has said, the adult midges are infected for life, but are short-lived and are killed by frost. And newly infected midges are not infected BTV replication in the midges is faster at higher temperatures, so outbreaks can be halted by low winter temperatures, as we've already said. However, the virus can be transmitted vertically. That is to say, from, from mother to fetus, um, leading to the birth of infected calves or lambs, and the release of virus in the birthing materials and potentially an opportunity for midges to bite the newly born animal. Um, and this was what actually happened as reported for an infected cow, I believe was imported from the Netherlands, a pregnant animal, gave birth in Ireland, and it resulted in transmission to another naive animal in Ireland with BTV8. Um, so giving, allowing the lambs and calves to have cholesterol, uh, cholesterol, um, is particularly important because that contains, will contain a lot of neutralizing antibodies from the mother and it helps to significantly halt viremia in the progeny. So that's an important aspect. Um, the virus also persists in the testes and we showed doing some work in Brazil that we found up to four different serotypes of blue tongue virus in the in the semen in the semen sample from a bull that had previously been infected, suggesting that the virus can persist long term in the semen. It's a, an immunoprivileged site, and it's difficult for the animal to clear it from there. And this maybe relates back to what was seen in France in 2015, because although the French authorities got rid of the virus by vaccination in 2010, there was a gap. And then it re-emerged in 2015. And it's thought that this is down to the use of artificial insemination with semen that contained the virus leading to infection and start of the outbreak post uh, insemination. Theoretically also, there may be a third mechanism for overwintering. Chris has, has said that, that not all the midges are immediately killed off by cold weather and some of them might survive right through the winter in barns or whatever, protected from the frost. Although I have to say personally, I think this is a pretty low priority. I don't think midges usually live that long and for them to survive for several months, hiding away just so they can transmit blue tongue, seems a little bit improbable. 
a little bit more detail on that. This is what happened in France. Um, the first outbreak shown here in purple, we were tracking the accumulation of point mutations in the genome of the virus from 2006 through to 2010 when it was eradicated. And you can see there's a gradual rate of mutation in the genome. Then the virus disappeared, reappeared in 2015, but the 2015 strain was essentially identical to a virus from 2008. And then the rate of mutation carried on at the same slope from then on. So the evolution of the virus was perhaps literally frozen. And we think it the most likely case is that it was in the form of, of frozen semen um, that was brought out, used for artificial insemination that restarted the outbreak. So um, rams and bulls that have been infected and, and semen used for artificial insemination must, must be thoroughly checked. A little bit on the vertical transmission. This is a, a dummy calf um, that was born. It, it um, looks a bit odd. Um, and in fact, it could walk in a straight line, which was perhaps surprising, but it really couldn't look after itself. It was, it was not gonna survive um, away from it, its mother. And at post-mortem, this is what was seen, that the cerebral hemispheres of the animal had completely failed to develop and were replaced, replaced by a fluid-filled sac. So this animal clearly was not um, a viable offspring. Um, and I think I'd, I'd just like to, to finish there and, and um, ask for any questions. One thing I would say, there's just this slide about vaccination. Um, the area covered by the circle was where the uh, infection occurred in, in uh, 2007, and you can see that it had burnt out in France. But then in 2008, it, the whole BT8 outbreak was spreading further and further south to all these farms, but it was controlled very effectively by vaccination, which was obligatory. And it went in one year, it dropped from 38,000 infected farms to 83 cases due to vaccination. So vaccination really does work. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. I'm, I'm more than happy to take any questions. Um, Peter, just going to uh, once again ask uh, one, or oh, actually two quick questions before we go over um, sure. to Rudolf. One is, how long does RNA synthesis take to occur? In other words, how long does the ambient temperature have to be above 12 degrees for an infected midge to become infective? Right. The 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 polymerase itself, uh, uh, the, um, it it's very temperature dependent, but at optimum temperature. Synthesis starts to occur within minutes, so it's quite quick. But it's not just the synthesis of the RNA. The RNA then has to be translated into proteins. The virus has to assemble. Then it has to escape from that cell into the hemocell of the midge, as, as Chris said, travel all the way to the salivary glands, infect more cells, and so on. And, and then it's released into the saliva and the insect injects the saliva in when it's biting to stop coagulation and so on and allow the blood to flow back into the insect. So um, it, it's the polymerase is the vital part of the virus, but the assembly and the movement process is, is not simply make the RNA. It's got to be all the other bits have got to be completed as well. OK, thank you very much. Um, and actually, we may as well cover this question off because I think it's going to be yeah. a quick one. If if it's spread by AI, could an infected bull infect the rest of the herd? I think you're going to say about midges there. No, because, it, right, a, a viremic animal, sure, um, but that's virus in the blood can infect midges and they can spread it. If it's actually in the testes, the animal is no longer, may not be viremic anymore. The, the, the antibody response, the immune response will have cleared it from the blood, but the virus still persists in the testes. And the argument is that, that the sperm is not actually the same as the bull that's producing it. It's, it's genetically different. So antibodies might target the semen and start destroying it. So antibodies and, and the immune response is kept out of the testes to some extent, 
because otherwise it could cause problems. But it means that if the virus gets in there, it can't be cleared easily by the animal. Um, but the bull itself is probably not a transmission risk by other means. So how does that start an outbreak? Sorry. If right. If if the the bull then inseminates um, a, a cow, then that virus can infect the, the naive cow, and the cow will become infectious and can transmit. Then can transmit to midges, and the whole thing goes thermonuclear. Okay, I was going to say brilliant, but that is not brilliant. I and thank you for for explaining it. Yeah, that's great. Um, Okay, thank you very much, Peter. I think there may be further Pleasure. questions for you afterwards, but we'll go over to um, <clears throat> Rudolf uh, because um, we've seen an increase in Schmallenberg. I was on a lambing farm yesterday with a few cases, uh, and um, this is very relevant potentially because the pathology is very similar, isn't it, Rudolf? Yeah, part of it can be very similar. Yeah. So if we can get over our first you. slide. Okay, there we go. Right, if we go to the first slide, thank you. Right, so we've had recent cases to APHA centers of reports during November and December, and also now into January of milk drop and malaise and dairy cattle, uh, fertility issues and sheep, sheep flocks. And then uh, when blood samples were taken, we had positive serology on bulk milks and also on um, bloods from sheep that's being used for export of germplasm. Uh, next slide, please. So now we've also had congenital deformed lambs being submitted uh, from a few weeks ago. So these would have been born at the end of December, start of January, uh, probably where the dams got infected about four weeks, uh, four months previously. And we've now had confirmed cases on PCR. The first one, Devon and Dorset, but we've also had counties of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire now reporting positives as well, and it's been confirmed. Next slide, please. So just a brief summary. There's a very good background information on the NADAS website there about Smallenberg virus, but it was first identified in 2011 in the Netherlands, Germany and Belgium. It's in the Orthobunia virus group, and it's similar to Akabani virus, and it infects and causes disease in sheep, cattle, and goats. Next slide, please. So it's spread by Culicoide species, um, um, midges of the Obsoletus complex. Uh, so you don't get direct transmission from animal to animal. And the spread has a blue tongue closely linked to a number of midges. So typically, you've got a peak in late summer, autumn, um, but obviously with warm weather, then that extends into winter as well, as we've seen this year. So initial outbreak in the UK was in 2012, 2013, again with windblown midges, as was the case of Bluton. Next slide, please. So you've got two forms that we can see. You've got the acute clinical disease in adult cattle, where they can have fever, reduced milk lead, inappetence, loss of body condition and diarrhea. Uh, we don't see that in sheep and goats. Big problem that we now start to see is the intrauterine infections causing congenital defects. And there's obviously an age range where these um, fetuses are very susceptible to the infection and then developing defects in cattle from 62 to 180 days and uh, sheep from 25 to 50 days. Uh, the idea is all the fetuses can possibly clear the virus themselves and don't get affected. Effects on early stage of pregnancy, we have, you know, we see reports of poor fertility. And then if you do the blood results and you see raised antibody levels, so possibly play a role in that as well. So in these fetuses where the virus comes in, it damages the fetal nerve tissue and that results in brain and spinal cord abnormalities. And then you get secondary effect on the muscles and skeleton resulting in the typical arthrogryposis. Next slide, please. So why are we mentioning Smallenberg virus during a webinar on blue tongue virus? The main reason is that blue tongue virus intrauterine infections can cause similar lesions in the brains of calves and lambs, as uh, was shown in that case that Peter had on his talk as well. 
and of course we have got concurrent or current positive BTV cases in England. So I mention it because you may encounter suspect cases and you have, will have to investigate if possible, please. The first thing is to rule out BTV, especially if those cases are in BTV high risk counties in England. So that's the southern counties on the coast. Uh, we also would like to confirm Schmollenburg virus because obviously we can't assume that they are Schmollenburg virus. It could be caused by a new virus, uh, not just BVD or border disease. And that would obviously be a catastrophe if we've got another new virus involved. And then of course, BTV3 is a new kid on the block. So we're not quite sure yet what it can do or whether it can cause arthrogryposis as well, because up to the appearance of this strain, it was sort of seen that the blue tongue strains did not cause arthrogryposis or hasn't been documented as such. Next slide, please. So the pathology that we see after the intrauterine infections can be born alive or dead at term or aborted. Uh, as we see when they're born alive, they can have then or present as dummy animals or dummy calves. The typical ones that are dead at term have got these bent limbs and fixed joints. It may be all the limbs and spine or only some limbs and joints. And then we see muscle wastage as well. And we can also see brain deformities, hydrin encephaly and damage to the spinal cord. We can see this persistent flexing fusion of the joints or arthrogryposis, which is very common in the typical appearance. But as we said, some animals may be born with a normal gross appearance, but then have nervous signs um, as, as Peter has shown. And then it, the deformities depend on when the infection occurred and, and obviously how severe it was as well. And then the odd thing is in sheep, sometimes you only have one lamb affected and the other twin or triplets are absolutely normal. Next slide, please. Uh, just of interest, if you've got extra or missing body parts from heads or limbs, or abnormalities of the internal organs, heart, lungs, liver, kidney or guts, or the genitals, then those are very unlikely to be due to Schmollenberg virus. And equally, they're probably unlikely to be caused by blue tongue virus as well. Next slide, please. So just some images of uh, affected cases of the calf on the left hand side there. Again, you can see it's quite a shortened body, uh, abnormal head, and then the, the legs are very strange, flexed forward, and those joints are stiff. You can't bend them, and that's why very often these cases end up in uh, needing cesareans because they just get stuck, they can't come out. Um, next slide, please. Uh, those are on the left is twin lambs that's been born, but again, it's very obvious they are very abnormal and twisted. Um, and uh, same on the right hand side. The next slide, please. Uh, just another typical thing we see with his lambs is the lower jaw that's shorter than the rest of the parrot beak, which is another giveaway. Next slide, please. So on the brains, when you open the cranium, and the fresh cases, the two slides above there, on the left-hand side, you can already see there's uh, um, a problem there with cerebellum very much diminished in size, and the spinal cord is actually very narrow or thin. And if we look at the top right-hand side, your um, cerebrum is a bit like a balloon filled with fluid, and uh, once you fix them, then you can see these cavities as shown on the bottom picture in the middle. Next slide, please. Um, and just on, on the on the previous slide, obviously, if you see those cavitation in the brain, that's typically what you can see with blue tongue virus as well. And then you have to uh, seriously consider the suspicion of blue tongue and uh, you know discuss that with your testing laboratory and report it as a suspect case. So the spinal cord, the top one there, is from a Schmollenberg affected case. You can see it's very narrow, very thin compared to the normal one at the bottom. Next slide, please. So again, when you take it out, you can see there's the brain on the right. Um, but again, the cerebellum is hardly there. And the spinal cord itself is, is very much thinned out to what it should be. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, there we go. So 
obviously it's it's quite a job to cut out the spinal uh, cord to see it but when you take the head off and you look down there um, then you can see again compared to the cavity there you've got a very much a reduced diameter of the spinal cord so a clear giveaway as well next slide please and again another one illustrating the same appearance next slide please so again, you know, if you open the head, um, you know, and you've got that sort of collapsed brain, that's just a fluid filled sac, is typical what you see, but again, not what you can see with blue tongue as well. So if that's what you presented with, um, then you have to uh, report that as a suspect blue tongue case. Next slide, please. So just another one again, uh, different, you haven't got the fluid filled thing, a bit of a, um, you know, succules on the side there but grossly very abnormal and certainly uh, not what you would expect to see next slide please so diagnosis and tests and reminder at the moment APHA are offering free testing for Schmollenberg virus which you can discuss with, uh, with our laboratories so based on clinical science and pathology please take some photographs it's always good to share that when you discuss the testing or possibilities of your laboratory uh, discuss your diagnostic laboratory about the testing and whether they offer free testing. If possible, submit the whole carcass, but if not, there's a number of samples that you can take. Um, you can either take an amniotic fluid scrape or a piece of fresh umbilicus or a piece of the brainstem. A PCR can be done on all those samples. We can get fetal fluid, which we can use for serology because sometimes the PCR is not positive, especially in calves, because the gestation age is, is or the gestation period is longer and sometimes they've cleared the virus by the time we get them. Uh, and then also maternal blood samples, um, either from the dam or sometimes from six adults to see what's happened in that particular herd or flock. And then additionally, it's probably good to have a bit of a brain if there's still brain to sample and then if you've got the uh, time and uh, know how to take uh, brain and spinal cord to be fixed uh, next slide please so that's just a, a slide from siuc showing how you collect that body scrape or amniotic fluid from the lamb fleece and if it's a fresh one then that actually works very well just to take a, a universal container like that and scrape it across the side and you gather some fluid and in the hands of SIUC, they get good results on that using the PCR. Um, next slide, please. So in summary, we've got BTV cases present at the moment. We've got Schmollenberg virus cases present. So there's unfortunate overlap of clinical signs and pathology following intrauterine infection. So please don't just assume you know what it is. Investigate and report any suspect blue tongue cases or ring your diagnostic center for advice. Uh, obviously, consider the following. Do you have brain lesions in stillbirth cases or abortions? Uh, do you see nervous signs in neonates or young stock? Are you, uh, is that animal from a high-risk uh, blue tongue virus county? Have you seen isocraposis? Is there any history like porting animals or trade from um, other countries? Or other clinical signs that raise the suspicion of blue tongue virus? <clears throat> And have we had Smallenberg virus already confirmed on the farm? And obviously, depending where you are, um, Wales or Scotland may have a slightly different approach to when they want uh, something reported as suspect to England. And it may also change as the knowledge and information about the outbreak advances going forward. Next slide, please. OK, that's me done. Thank you, Fiona. Over back to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Rudolph, for um, that update. And so you're encouraging um, vets to encourage their farmers to, to be submitting samples to you if it's uh, SBV suspect. Even, so farmers are quite complacent, really. They, oh, we've seen Schmannenberg before. Mm. We know what this is. But you would still encourage them to submit cases. Um, I think so, yeah, because the, obviously the concern is there are other viruses that can cause that as well, like Akebana virus. And as we've seen, sometimes, you know, we've got the incursion of new viruses happening quite frequently. So we want to be sure that it is Schmollenberg virus and not another virus that causes the same 
problems. And the other thing is, as I mentioned, BTV3 is new and not anywhere else or not this particular strain. So we don't fully know yet exactly what it can cause. So there is the potential that it, it may cause exactly or very similar signs to, to Schmollenberg virus. So I think we need to get those cases in to test that and, and be certain what we're dealing with. Brilliant. Thanks, Rudolf. That's very helpful. And I'm sure the vets watching will um, take that on board. OK, Thanks. I'm just I've got two questions here that I'm going to take together. And it's um, basically for uh, Sasha or Gordon. Um, and uh, so one uh, question one is, have you carried out any tracer testing of animals recently moved out of the um, TCZs? And I'll follow that up quite quickly. But do you want to just answer that immediately, Sasha? I don't know if Sasha's there. It's Gordon. So um, okay. what we're doing is any of the farms where we've got positive cases, um, we've done the tracings in that high risk window um, back to the 1st of September. And to date, all of them have been negative. Um, what we haven't done yet and um, we'll be exploring is other moves on premises where um, disease hasn't yet been confirmed, but we, we may well um, do other tracings out of the zone and, and do some further exploration. But so far, everything is negative, but everything has been traced and will be traced. And, and what, what the process is that those trace animals are, are placed under restriction. Um, and they're then tested and, until they come back negative. Um, it can be getting a little bit tricky where that animal um, may subsequently have been culled. And so we need to explore other options for managing that premises where we can't actually prove that the animal that moved was negative, but it still re remains a risk. So there are a couple of premises around GB that are under restriction. Um, because we can't prove that the animal that went there is negative. I don't know if Sasha wants to add anything. No, I, I think okay, you well, Okay, well, this question might, this is sort of very closely related um, and it's quite long and I might be a bit easier if I uh, read it. Um, so, if the current surveillance is to identify positive animals so they can be culled as a means to reduce virus level, um, are we, should we not be um, should we not be looking more for non-clinical viremic animals that are out with the TCZs in the eastern region? Um, are, so I suppose the questioner is saying, are we confident that we're doing enough surveillance outside those areas at the moment? So I'll just start by saying we're actually we need to look within the zone to find as much um, disease as possible that is there so that we can pick all that up. So that that's obviously our, our highest priority at the minute. And indeed, we we will see how um, we move forward once we get to the vector free period um, on on those movements outside of of the zone. But I'll let Gordon come in there as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if, if you look at what happened in Kent, where we got a, 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 it was clear that animals, although we tested in the TCZ, they'd originated in the very near um, past outside of the zone and they tested positive. We then extended the TCZ. And so hence we're extending the, um, the testing in that area. We also re remember, I, I think um, Chris mentioned the annual blue tongue survey. So that's those high risk counties. Um, Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, um, Kent, East, West Sussex, Round, Devon, Dorset, Hampshire. You know, we are that that is designed to detect an incursion, and hence that's how we found the Norfolk case and the Kent case. So I'm not saying that we won't do some more um, testing in that area, but we're just focusing our effort on where we know that there's potential infection, and you know, for the reasons that Peter mentioned, you know, in terms of buying ourselves some time and um, prevent potential overwintering and trying to stop a you know an early explosion next year from from stuff that's already arrived we we can't stop stop it blowing over from the continent but at least we can try and contain it and manage it um from what has arrived um here 
Yeah. OK, thank you. This is a very practical question. So if a farm does go down with a positive case of blue tongue, does the whole flock need to be tested before leaving the farm for slaughter? So if there's a positive case, is that what you said? Yes. If a farm has a positive t t case, yeah. does that entail the entire flock or herd being tested before yeah. anything? So, so as soon as we have a, a positive case, um, that whole, I mean, we are testing all animals in any case in the surveillance zone, but then we would take that as a priority and test the rest of the animals of that particular farm. Um, they will be under restrictions as well, so they get separate restrictions compared to um, to the zonal restrictions, and that makes that they cannot move any animals on or off without um, a license, um, and that would need to be risk assessed. So um, yeah, so it depends, but definitely all animals will need sampling, but whether they can move off is is um, linked to licensing. Yes, I, okay. I think it's unlikely we would license a move to slaughter until we'd tested all of those animals or yeah. there was sort of pre-movement test. Can, yeah. can, okay. can, I, can I add a comment yeah. to that? Um, blue tongue, the, the conventional blue tongue viruses are normally considered to be very poorly, if at all, transmitted directly animal to animal. We've even done experiments at Furbright in the old days where we had uninfected and infected animals in the same pen and the virus didn't cross between them. So it is it is really very much down to knowing if there's a positive case on the farm, we know some midges arrived, presumably blown in to that farm, and there's nothing to say it was just one midge. It might have been a few dozen and they might have bitten more than one animal i think is the point mm -hmm. thanks peter um i've got a couple of questions here um which i may be able to answer as well as anyone else so one is when will when will vaccines be available will it, will they be made in the uk and someone else is asking will we consider vaccinating and i think from we've been a number of meetings um over the last couple of months uh, looking to view of encouraging companies to to make vaccines we're not necessarily in control of that because it's a commercial um consideration i don't know rudolf peter or, well any one of you do you want to comment on the situation with vaccination having also sat through a few of those meetings I, I, I suppose from, a, from a policy perspective we would absolutely support vaccination and you know, we want to actively engage with the pharmaceutical companies to get an efficacious vaccine that's safe, et cetera, and that can be authorised for use. Um, I, I think, so that, that, I guess that's the easy bit. It's um, whether or not any of the, the farmers in, in the UK are interested or prepared to develop a, a vaccine. Uh, and there, you know, there is a bit of a question about you know, what the demand is as well. I mean, Peter obviously mentioned the fact that um, in 2007, um, DEFRA underwrote that. Um, it, DEFRA also, it cost DEFRA quite a lot of money because there was a lot of unused vaccine because farmers didn't want to take it up. Um, I'm not sure that we are in the space at the moment of mandatory vaccination, but that remains an option that we, that we would consider. But at the moment, there isn't one. Uh -huh. And I know when we had these conversations and meeting a month or two back and there was certain reluctancy because of um, w vaccine was what got us out of the issue back in 2007-8 and um, I, I certainly had a number of clients say to me, well, why did we panic, it, it, you know, that the fact that we vaccinated meant we didn't have a problem rather than we shouldn't have vaccinated. Um, when we asked colleagues in the Netherlands, their, their comment was 100% of Dutch farmers would vaccinate if they could when they'd, when they'd asked the situation. So um, I think there's a lot of going on in the background trying to, uh, yeah, trying to work on a BTV3 vaccine, but um, we don't know any details of that yet. I would just very much like it to be available in, in within the next few months, whether that's realistic, I don't know. I think, I think we all would and, you know, Obviously, the position in the Netherlands in terms of clinical science and clinical disease and, you know, mortality rates and milk drop, etc. 
is very different to what we experienced in 2008 and indeed France up until quite recently of, of experience for, for Blue Tongue 8. So, uh, you know, if, if we get what the Netherlands have got and if we get a, you know, an outbreak that looks like that and if our naive animals um, react in the same way, I think a lot of farmers would, you know, voluntarily. But, you know, you, you know your, your clients will, you know, that'll be a discussion with, between you and they. Um, you know, it's very much a commercial decision. Um, and I guess it depends on their circumstances. It will, I think, also depend, you know, if, if we, we haven't discussed zones, obviously we've discussed the TCZ. If we get circulating virus, we will put in place a restricted zone. We will put in place much bigger zones. Uh, and that means, you know, if you are, there will be more people wanting to move animals out of zones and there are very limited options for moving animals out of a zone unless they've been vaccinated or, you know, tested double negative, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Gordon. Um, certainly somebody's just put in that in 2008 in Norfolk, they had a very high um, appetite for vaccination and certainly where around the country, yeah, may make a difference. Um, uh, this is a question, it may be for Peter, but um, uh, relating to what's happened in the Netherlands, why why are we seeing so many more cattle infected rather than sheep? And how is that comparing to the outbreak in the Netherlands? And, and why have we not seen um, clinical cases as yet? All right, I'm, I'm the, the um, traditional answer for this is cows are much bigger than sheep. So they produce more of these attractive um, chemicals that, that bring the midges in. They're also, because they're not covered densely in wool, um, they're much easier for the midges to bite. Uh, and, and from the point of view of blue tongue, cattle are much more important in terms of the spread and persistence of the virus. They, they have a longer viremia, they tend to have a higher viremia than in sheep. But they don't usually, most of the cases in cattle don't show clinical signs, which may seem slightly counterintuitive. But in sheep, although the infection is, is slightly lower, sheep, if you like, are the indicator host, and they suffer much more severe clinical signs, including fatalities. I think during BTV8 in the Netherlands, the case fatality in sheep was something like 25%. Um, in cattle, it was below 1% and it was mainly in, in um, uh, Belgian blue cows were particularly susceptible, a very pale uh, cow were, were particularly susceptible. So breed makes a difference as well, um, but, but cattle are, are largely asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, J uh, just as a, as a comment really about the vaccination, how successful no question that vaccination worked 2007 and 8 um preventing more widespread infection i would i would totally concur with that um and uh gareth points out we have a collective job to communicate that to the livestock industry so yes as soon as we have a vaccine i don't think there'll be any doubt about it i think the current issue is encouraging somebody to make us a, a suitable vaccine um Okay, uh, this is a practical question, um, probably for Sasha or Gordon. In terms of finished stock, will more abattoirs be designated in the near future as we get to, nearer to the period of higher hoggett slaughter numbers? So the straight answer is, I hope so. Um, you know, and if, if any of any farmers on the call or any vets um, encourage those farmers, please encourage all of your outlets to get designated now. It's not that onerous. Yes, there are some um, operational issues in terms of vector control, etc. And it depends on the abattoir. But we want as many and as, as many options as there are. You know, we haven't really got a cull cow abattoir um, designated yet either. Um, so we'd, we'd really like more. Um, so. Yes, please. <laughs> OK, thanks, Gordon. Um, OK, I think this is the last question. We've gone over time. Um, do do and this is for Peter, I suspect. Um, do wild deer have a potential to be a reservoir for BTD? 
Um, deer can certainly be infected. Um, how significant they are in terms of onward transmission, uh, we don't know. During during the BTV8 outbreak, they were ignored. They were simply ignored out of the picture. We still controlled it. Um, so I think that in itself suggests, yes, yeah, sure, they can become infected, but epidemiologically, they are probably much less important than cattle in particular. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, right, I think um, possibly now uh, we'll wrap it up now. We are going to have another webinar in a fortnight's time. Um, if you've got, there will be a feedback sheet at the end of the at the end of this webinar it will end quite quickly but there is a feedback and we would like to have continued questions or any further uh, items that you would like us to cover in further webinars and um, I think it just remains to say thank you very much um, to Sasha and Gordon and Rudolph and Peter and Chris for um, thank you very much for um, contributing to the webinar and um, and thank you also to the audience everyone who's um, submitted their questions um, the will, we will send round the recording um, within the next 24 hours. So um, thank you everyone very much for listening. Thank you, Fiona. For Thanks.